So thank you all. I'm Marie Marquardt. I first wanted to just say thank you so much to Miguel de la Torre for framing our discussion for the rest of the morning and the rest of the day so well. Um, I also want to say that uh, I, when I'm sort of teetering on the brink of hopelessness, I find myself turning to the folks who are sitting here to my left um, and uh, really just want to say how deeply grateful I am for them to be here with us um, and to be able to share this space with them this morning. These are three remarkable people, all of whom are doing really innovative and profoundly important work uh, with immigrant detainees and their families. In the words of Miguel, they're seeing the face of Jesus every day and being transformed by that encounter. So I look so forward to hearing about their um, work. Anton Flores, who is our first speaker, is the co-founder of Alterno, which is a Christian missional community comprised of U.S. citizens and Latin American immigrants. Um, it, Alterna is located in LaGrange, Georgia. And Anton is also one of the founders um, and the kind of host of a hospitality house called El Refugio that's located outside a private immigration detention center in Lumpkin, Georgia. Um, David Farcado is on the end there. Uh, is the Executive Director of Faith Action International House in Greensboro, North Carolina, just very recently moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, and also serves as the National Coordinator of the Detention Visitation Network. Um, and finally, we have Sister Joanne Frisch, um, who opened uh, Sukasa Catholic Worker Community for Central American Refugees Seeking Political Asylum. And currently, she serves as the Peace and Justice Minister for the Sisters of Mercy in Chicago. So again, these people know perhaps as well as anyone the everyday realities of immigrant detention and deportation. And we've asked them to share insights into sort of their best practices for advocacy and education on these issues. And really tell us how, again, in the words that Miguel used, to dance with the system. Good morning, my name is Anton Flores Masonet, and I'm going to share with you first just a bit about uh, our response to immigration detention. Well, let me just talk just briefly about Alterna. The name Alterna or Alterna is uh, intentional. It was inspired by the writings of Walter Brueggemann, who said that the prophetic community must be an alternative to the dominant culture of oppression. And so we live with uh, immigrants from Guatemala and from Mexico, uh, together with my family, sharing life interdependently, uh, growing food together, raising chickens and goats together, all within a, 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 a semi-urban community neighborhood. Uh, but we also gather together uh, for prayer, for meals, and for theological reflection, especially what does it mean uh, to be the people of God in a, in a climate that is becoming increasingly uh, dehumanizing uh, towards our, our immigrant brothers and sisters who are our neighbors and our relatives and our friends and the people with whom we love uh, there at Alterna. So, so we understand this, un, this concept of hospitality as being that alternative. Um, and so it is a radical notion. It is confrontational as well as welcoming. Uh, it, it is both resistance work for us as, as much as it is uh, the acceptance work. And we live an hour and a half away from the largest immigration detention center in the United States, uh, Stewart Detention Center. And I visited Stewart Detention Center when it was one of those uh, prisons of dreams, the build it and they will come. I visited it in about 2005 when it was just an empty, medium level security prison that had no contract. And it was in 2007 that I learned about a hunger strike that was going on inside by a group of Salvadoran immigrants. And I realized, wait, this, is, this empty facility has become an immigration detention center. And so in conjunction with Quinonia Farm, Quinonia Partners, which has a history of hospitality and resistance in Georgia, uh, together in 2007 we held the very first vigil outside of this facility. And so what I want to do is just talk about how being rooted in a community with immigrants has led to some responses to seeing where some of our very own immigrant brothers and sisters with whom we live could end up, but who also have shown the valor and, and, the, and the resilience to say, we must speak out. And so we began with these vigils in 2007. Uh, and now, actually in November, November 18th, in conjunction with the SOA Watch vigil, we'll be holding our fifth vigil. 
At these vigils, we brought attention to the hunger strikes, we brought attention to deaths in this detention center, we, and we've also joined the campaign of individuals that have been a part, that have been detained there and whose families have been fighting for their release. In 2010, our vigil took a next step, which included acts of civil disobedience. And I, along with seven others, including the mother-in-law of a detainee, uh, were arrested for criminal trespass. As what we decided that we wanted to do was that as, after, as a part of this vigil, we said that we wanted to do a Jericho walk, prayer walk, walk seven times around the detention center, praying for the days when those walls would come down, knowing full well that CCA would not allow us to do that, but yet wanting to be that moral and spiritual voice of conviction that there is an alternative. And I think that's important for us just to think about as we think about what is the prophetic. The prophetic does not look to the political. The prophetic does not look to what's pragmatic. The prophetic holds to what is true. And for us, the vigils, and even engaging in civil disobedience, what we call divine obedience, is clinging to that which is true. The vigils started in 2007. As a result of the vigils, and as a result of the gospel of YouTube, uh, families began to call us, families of detainees, and they were telling us about their loved ones who were there in this remote facility three hours away from, from Atlanta, in a town of 1,300 people. There are more people inside this detention center than there are in the town. I could understand and I could empathize with what the judge said. In Stewart County, one in three people live below the poverty level. They are in desperate need of economic infusion. Now, what the judge didn't mention is that while this facility is there, and so purportedly there to provide jobs, it's the very immigrants who are supposedly unauthorized to work in this nation who are doing the cooking and the cleaning for CCA at $1 to $3 per day, while one in three live below the poverty level. The visitations have been a wonderful way for us to not only show solidarity and support to the immigrants who are inside this detention center, but it's also been a way for us to educate mid-pew Christians, mid-pew churchgoers, mid-pew Americans into the realities of immigration detention. For them to hear themselves of the lack of mental health treatment, the lack of health care, the verbal and, and physical abuse, the use of solitary confinement for transgender detainees, for them to hear all of these stories themselves and for them to be transformed. And for that then to begin to be a part of the transformation of this system of control. And so the visitations continue. But we can only sit in the, in the detention center visiting room so often and notice something. That here we saw also wives and girlfriends and parents and children <coughs> traveling from North Carolina, South Carolina, six, seven hours, one way, for a one hour visit after spending three hours in, the, in this inhospitable waiting room where the children were being told to be calm and be quiet and not be children or else they would be removed from the facility. And then to see the families leaving, an emotional wreck, as they face the uncertainty of what might happen, to then have to do the six, seven hour drive again. <laughs> and so a year ago, a small group of us, oh actually I should add, we did pilgrimages, well I forgot about this book, I'll come back to the pilgrimages. Uh, a small group of us, launched the House of Hospitality and Resistance. We call it El Refugio, and it's alternative hospitality house located outside the gates of Stewart Detention Center. Uh, I pause there for intentional reasons. If you know your theology, the gates of, is where the church should be. And it's out of this place that now we invite in, out of this small house that we rent for 450 bucks a month, one mile from the detention center, staffing it on the weekends with all volunteers that we say to families you can spend the night here for free there's no hotels in this town you can eat here for free there's one there's one restaurant you can stay here for free it, like while folks are visiting if you're afraid of your own immigration status being in the detention center and just know that you have a place of emotional and spiritual support uh, throughout all this and it's been a wonderful phenomenal way to engage volunteers in a, in, a, in a way that lets them know that they can be an active part of being that alternative to the system of domination. 
Now the photos that I have here, I'm going to use the last five minutes of my time. I think I'm, I don't know how I'm doing on time. But I'm going to go to eight minutes. Oh, I still got eight minutes. Well, let me go back to Vigils. The program is here. <laughs> I've got a five-minute video that I want to show, so I want to make sure to leave time for that. Pilgrimages are another response that we've done. So we've had vigils, we've had visitations, and now we're doing radical hospitality, uh, but also pilgrimages. When I say we, I'm talking about just a small group of us. Um, at Alterna, there is no staff. Um, I, do, I was a professor of social work at a Methodist college and left that five years ago, and I'm doing what I'm doing pro bono. My wife's a public school teacher. Um, and, and everyone that, that is doing it is doing it as a labor of love. But the pilgrimages are another part of what we, what we, what we, did, what we began. And this is slightly different. Uh, this happens uh, twice. Once during the week leading up to the SOA Watch pilgrimage, uh, where we've just kind of joined with that. We've been inspired by some Buddhist uh, monks who do this, and we join with them. And then they join us for the vigil on that Friday. But another one that we do is during Holy Week. And this is in Atlanta. It actually starts north of Atlanta in a town called Gainesville on Palm Sunday. And we walk from Gainesville uh, to Atlanta during Holy Week. Approximately a thousand immigrants will walk this pilgrimage, carrying a cross and a sign that simply says, Pilgrimage for Immigrants. But we will walk through uh, three 287G communities and a secure community, quote unquote. And on Holy Thursday, we gather in the Marietta Town Square, Cobb County, uh, which, is the, which is the district and the, and the home of, of the most vocal and vehement anti-immigrant activists and politicians. Here we gather on Holy Thursday, 500 people walking from the town of Smyrna to the town of Marietta. We gather in the square, and on the stage in the square, we have 10 immigrants and 10 U.S. citizens, and the U.S. citizens wash the feet of the immigrants. Lastly, with these photos again, you'll see a celebratory image here, because once again, there is hope. This is Pedro Guzman and his son Logan, uh, and then at the top is uh, some of our volunteers at El Refugio and the mother-in-law, who once again, uh, she's uh, the second from the left. She and I were, were two of the eight who were arrested last November at the vigil at the Stewart Detention Center, calling for his detention. He'd been detained for over a year. Uh, in March, he was released. And I just wanted to sh share with you a video that the Los Angeles Times did about, about the story because uh, this Los Angeles Times piece and the story of Emily and Pedro Guzman is really the convergence of everything that we've been doing uh, the last couple of years in terms of vigils and visitations and radical hospitality. wife and son by he was arrested at home on visa violations and he's been in jail for the past 19 months they can visit Pedro but it's an exhausting nine-hour drive from North Carolina to the detention facility in Georgia the trip back is horrendous because every mile we drive we're further away from him that's hard for Logan. Sometimes I can't even make it home. I have to stop. A few days before the final deportation hearing that could send him back to Guatemala, Emily talks to Pedro on the phone. I'm nervous about this whole thing going on. All I want is, yeah. all I want is for us to get a decision on Monday. That's all. I just, <laughs> just want for it to actually happen. Okay, did you hear that? A long, long drive to Georgia begins at the home of Emily's mom and her fiancé. We're now heading out uh, towards Pedro's hearing. We've been working towards getting this individual hearing, and it will happen on uh, Monday. So we're going to be driving nine and a half hours to Lumpkin, Georgia today. Can I eat the cat? Is this a way of, um, uh, what do you call it, processing? Stay at El Refugio and would stay at this every time. And they're heading to 
two of the stores to add two El Refugio. Um, I'm guessing we've been well. there seven or eight times. That's about 8,000 miles. Emily rests on a sofa bed at a shelter near the detention center in Lumpkin, Georgia. She worries that if Pedro loses, he'll be deported back to Guatemala, a place that neither of them know. Pedro was only 18 months old when his mother fled the country. When you call me up as a witness, will it be okay if Logan sits on my lap, or does he need to sit with somebody else? Well, he's going to need to sit with somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Because really, well, I'm, 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 we have to concentrate on here is the hardship. Yeah, totally. Because you, you've never been there. And I've never been there. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Your what? Oh, your blue shirt? Okay. Take your battles, right? <laughs> Please visualize. Um, Judge Dan Trimble saying these words, I hereby grant relief under NACARA for Pedro Perez Guzman so that he may um, be allowed to live and work in the United States. <laughs> and so we have a lot of people that are picturing that today. No recording was allowed in court. During an emotional two hours of testimony, the bailiff handed out tissues to just about everyone. First, the judge ruled Pedro can stay in the United States. But the prosecutor immediately reserved the right to appeal, and Emily's husband remained in jail. Late the next morning, as the family was on the drive back home to North Carolina, Emily received a call that the appeal had been dropped. They sped back to the shelter in Lumpkin, Georgia, for the reunion with Pedro. <laughs> I never want to let you go. <laughs> neighbor 
as you love yourself. And that sermon led me to a group called Sojourners a Visitation Ministry with Detained Immigrants and Asylum Seekers, a group that went and traveled from New York City, Upper West Side, out to the Elizabeth Detention Center about 45 minutes away, a stone's throw from the Statue of Liberty in an abandoned airport warehouse that housed 300 men and women from all over the world. I all of a sudden found myself face to face with, on a weekly basis, a Tibetan Buddhist mother who had fled uh, Chinese religious persecution after her husband was killed. West African men and women who had fled in grain containers on cargo ships for seven days with very little food or water. A young woman who had fled uh, guerrilla military activity in Colombia um, who was forced to be a dental assistant, had a coyote give her false documents and then was stopped at JFK Airport only to find herself at 18 years old inside of detention. Two, a young Guatemalan man from a nearby town in New Jersey who was a soccer star, an honor student, uh, who had come here when he was three years old and all of a sudden when ICE had come looking for his mother and his mother wasn't there, found himself inside the detention facility. So you have all these people inside of this abandoned warehouse uh, in, in New Jersey and you got a small town kid trying to be a big shot actor all of a sudden face to face with these people on a weekly basis for the next eight years. And I came, uh, and I am still struggling with this issue, with a tremendous amount of privilege. Um, I was able to come and go from the detention facility, all, faci all visitors are aware, whatever clothes we want, and all of a sudden we're face to face with somebody who's brought in like um, much less than a human being, like cattle dressed in clothes that they don't want to wear, not their food, not their culture, very little medical or mental uh, health care, and some of the world's most traumatized people put into a brand new traumatizing situation. And I remember after my first visit, I visited one of your West African men that I told you about, and I needed the driver to stop uh, and as we were heading back to the West Side um, because I had a reaction that I'd never had before. Uh, something was bubbling up inside of me. I asked him to stop and I started to almost dry heave on the side of the road. And at first I thought it was nerves, uh, but as I've come to reflect on this later on, I realized that a part of what I was trying to purge was my own privilege, was my um, own guilt over some of that privilege and purging of, of ego. And, um, and I've come to understand that that's a part of um, what needs to happen for a large part of the white uh, middle class. And I'm still trying to purge uh, a lot of that if we're going to come together on this issue. For me, I, when I, I had a professor in seminary talk about the uh, I had a Martin and Malcolm class. And he talked constantly about the struggle between um, Malcolm saying, let the house burn, let the system burn. And Martin saying, our children are inside that house, we need to be firemen. And I tend to agree with Martin on that, and that's why I understand my role in this is a lot of dealing with a lot of my white brothers and sisters and where our entry point and what change we need to do um, on, on this issue. Because I refuse to give up on them. I want to speak with a prophetic voice, and I'm a big believer in Jesus as prophet, but I'm also very much a big believer in Jesus as counselor meeting people where they're at on this issue. And for me, it's important if we're going to move forward as a society on this issue, we got to find uh, the balance in that as, as, as Christians, at least from my own tradition. And there's a tremendous power dynamic when I went and visited these folks. Again, I could wear whatever I want, I could come and go, and the power dynamic was, was here. But we as visitors found ways to try and as much as possible bring that power dynamic down a little bit more. It was never going to be even, but part of the way that happened was by us being able to bear witness to the tremendous courage and resilience, it was a privilege to see other people inside who were surviving, oftentimes using their faith to do so. When I heard about some of my Muslim brothers and sisters still praying five times a day and fasting for Ramadan in the midst of that kind of torture and suffering, it made me as a Christian start to take Lent a little bit more seriously and to take prayer a little bit more seriously. That's one example. It was such a privilege to see their courage and resilience and the best of humanity in the midst of that kind of suffering that I quit acting. I went to seminary and I still say to this day I'm a Christian pastor because of my Muslim West African brothers and sisters, my Colombian Catholic brothers and sisters uh, inside of detention, uh, my Tibetan Buddhist uh, 
Folks, I'm a minister because of their example. They became the teachers for me. And for me, a lot of Jesus' subversive parables speak to that very uh, dynamic and gives me hope for where, uh, as for how white folk, privileged folk, can have an entry point and can have their hearts and minds transformed um, on this issue. And a verse in the Bible became all of a sudden extremely important to me as to where when I was, for instance, on an actor 10 years beforehand at a, a pancake house and um, doing summer stock, and I went to my favorite pancake house, and there's a little a verse at the bottom of the of the um, menu that said, never neglect to show hospitality to the strangers, for in doing so some have entertained angels unawares. And I thought, well, that's a nice thing to put in a restaurant, and this is what the restaurant was doing. I had no idea that, that many years later that verse would take on so much more um, profundity for, for, for me. Um, and I want to note that my particular comments, I really feel, focus around the wild card in all of this, which is human relationship. Never underestimate the power of human relationship that, as far as I'm concerned, does so much more in terms of transforming the heart and the mind than speeches, than, I would even say, demonstrations, than education on this uh, issue. And I really want to focus a lot of my comments on the power, the transforming heart and mind power of relationship to have us move forward as a country and be transformed as a country uh, on this issue. And to be careful not to demonize others and recognize what is necessary for hearts and minds to be transformed and the crucial role that, that relationship plays in doing so. I want to note that I am thrilled that this conference, the first conference that I've known about, but specifically around attention, that is putting faith in the title. For me, uh, faith communities are an entirely untapped resource on this issue. It, it, faith communities have tipping point potential on this issue. For instance, if you were to look at the numbers of houses of worship that out, they outnumber uh, detention facilities within a 30 mile radius, 500 or 1,000 to 1. There is no reason why the faith communities shouldn't be taking the lead, especially on some of those rural areas where you feel like these detention facilities, I don't know, they're not. There are faith communities there that ought to be doing tremendous work um, on this issue. As you heard from the uh, previous speakers, all faiths uh, share uh, some moral values and moral imperatives on this issue. One, uh, welcoming the stranger across faith traditions. And welcoming the stranger means welcoming God. And for me, welcoming the stranger is not just about the hospitality power dynamic that was, was spoken to, but if you understand welcoming the stranger is welcoming God, then the power dynamic evens out a whole lot more. Uh, two, uh, as we heard about uh, the, the dignity of, of every human being is a valued part of creation, capital C, and the image of God, the role that that plays in that. And the, and the religious foundations for the human rights um, movement. The calls for the unity of humankind. One of my favorite verses from the Quran is, Allah made us different nations and tribes that we might come to know one another. And stories of migration within religious texts themselves. Jesus himself was a refugee. And it's interesting that a lot of our prophets um, and storytellers from the Bible, it was when they were in the midst of a migration crisis that they had some of the most powerful experiences with God. And our chaplains in the audience here can very much speak to that. And I had the privilege of seeing that. And as a result, God came became very uh, real to me um, inside of, of detention. A lot of religious communities are involved from speaking out um, in the pulpit to um, adult education pieces uh, after, uh, after sermons to public demonstrations as vigils, as we, as we saw um, from Alterna, um, and are oftentimes first responders to a lot of the families who are, um, who are harmed uh, by our uh, horrible detention and deportation uh, policies. But the one that I want to focus on in my entry point, again, was visitation, detention visitation. Visitation does essentially four key pieces. One, it befriends and accompanies people in the midst of tremendous crises, isolation, depression, and that's a powerful, powerful piece uh, that, that happens. What, uh, what I like to call unlikely friendships that occur across that glass uh, inside of detention centers. Uh, two visitors also act as the eyes and the ears of the detention facilities, and in that regard, play a monitoring and oversight 
role inside of a lot of these detention facilities. Uh, three, they create, through their own networks back in their community, a network of community support. Oftentimes they're able to find lawyers, they're able to potentially find some medical professionals, they're able to find social workers, and if people are released and they don't have family or friends to, uh, to go to, they oftentimes are able to provide housing, food, clothing, shelter, they may accompany them to court appointments. So just know that visitors play a myriad of roles and I think are very important a role in terms of the detention um, issue. The network, and, and a quick note, the JRS, um, Jesuit Refugee Service, was way ahead of the curve. They were doing visitation way back in the 90s on this issue, and a lot of the detention visitation programs owe a debt of gratitude to their work. And also note that um, there's a fantastic resource, if you haven't seen it, from Clue out of L.A., that put out something about um, the role of, of uh, visitors in the religious community uh, during Angel Island. So this is something that religious groups have been doing for years and years and years and, and know how to do it. Uh, the network itself, the Detention Visitation Network, um, grew over two years from five groups to 20 nationally despite extremely limited resources. We use an email listserv and essentially a call uh, once a month on a, uh, on a conference call. We share best practices and experiences inside of, uh, of, of detention. Um, and most of these detention visitation programs are connected to faith communities. The other key group that hasn't even been brought up in this um, that are a tremendous ally for detention work are students. They make up about the other 40% of detention visitation programs and universities and students ought to be brought up a whole lot more. Uh, there's a generation here that's growing into our new diversity and polls show that they value the gifts that new immigrants uh, and refugees bring about 30% more than those 65 and older. Uh, we essentially at Faith Action have a theory of change, and this is where I want to go back to speak about um, my white um, brothers and sisters and the middle of the road, 50% of what Frank calls the swayable public on this issue. And it looks like this. This is a closed mind for your average uh, white um, evangelical person. And it, I found that it essentially takes five things to begin to open that mind halfway. One is understanding America as an immigrant country and placing their own ancestry within that story. Two is a deep faith uh, reflection and beginning to use their moral guts or their faith, faith voice on the issue um, instead of just their political one. Three is understanding our demographic shifts and the push-pull factors that bring people here and hearing the very real stories behind those, using film, documentary film to, to show that. Um, Four is uh, myth-busting, the illegality issue and the economic issue, especially myth-busting around that. And five I'm discovering here is a lot more of just some basic human rights and racism education. I've found that if you can hit your average 50% of the swayable public on those pieces in an adult education class during or after church, the mind opens about halfway. At the point that that mind is open halfway, they might be willing to risk being in relationship to somebody who is a new immigrant and refugee. And that's why it's crucial for our faith communities to not only speak out on this issue, but find ways to put people in relationship. And that's why detention visitation is so important. Once that relationship happens, and you start eating together, praying together, laughing together, kicking the soccer ball together, that rest of that mind blows open. And all of a sudden, you no longer have an uneducated public person who was kind of anti-immigrant and had tons of white privilege. You have somebody who all of a sudden is an activist who's beginning to purge themselves of that privilege. It is relationship that I've seen more than anything else that blows that door open. And a challenge for me to the immigrants' rights movement is not only to be speaking out prophetically, but to balance that out with opportunities for relationship to happen. Tremendous things happen in relationship. It's a wild card not to be... Um, underestimated. Some recommendations that I have um, just to leave here. One, I think the secular uh, immigrant rights community could use a lot more faith literacy for knowing how to speak out to the, to the faith community. Two is for this movement to hook up with the Interfaith Immigration Coalition. They just did something called a Dream Act Sabbath and had about 400 events around the country at different faith communities. Four is to fund young people in this, commun in this room right now to take the accumulated knowledge that we've heard today and go out to those faith communities that are within a 30 mile radius of detention facilities and do that education work and put and get them involved in some of the detention um, work. And finally, I just want to note that we have chaplains in the room, and I just have learned the crucial role of chaplains inside of detention facilities, um, who are the moral voice, the single moral voice 
um, there inside of the facilities who have tremendous potential to make some things happen and a lot more partnership with chaplains out of the detention facilities um, need to happen. So um, I greatly appreciate um, all of the collective knowledge that's here and I hope we turn that into something programmatic. Thanks. Good morning. The title of this conference, Imprisoned, Forgotten, Deported, really grabbed me at the heart of what Sister Pat Murphy and I were drawn to in the state of Illinois. It is at the heart of what we do and who we are to see that those detained and deported know that they are not forgotten and to make the community know that these are human beings that we are talking about each with their own life story each with the family it's dark and sometimes raining at 3:45 a.m. on Friday as we approach the Homeland Security Building. We see people lined up along the building with bags of various shapes and sizes. These are the families coming to say goodbye. This is Deportation Day. This is where it happens. And imagine the feeling in their heart. Four of us are escorted through security and go downstairs. Two of us go to the visitation room where men and women being deported can come and talk to someone with their fears, their anger, and their broken heart. We give them information about safe houses across the border, we talk with them and offer to make a call to their family who very often has no idea they're being deported that day and also pray with them if they would like and they love the prayer of protection that we will say with them the other two of us stay out with the families who are so anxious and we give them information about what might be happening to their loved one. We advocate for them because often we need to do that. And after they've said goodbye, we comfort them because you can imagine how they are feeling knowing their loved one is leaving their life that day. On Tuesday at 11.30 a.m., a group of men and women of different faiths gather in the lobby of McHenry County Jail in Woodstock, Illinois, two hour ride from Chicago. These are the pastoral workers who will be going in to meet with the over 400 men and women detained there. We can't see them all every week, so we have to rotate. We're there from noon to 4 p.m. and they sign up and come to see us. And we are blessed and they are blessed because we are in the room with them. We can touch them, we can hold their hand, but no hugging. <laughs> Sister Pat gets in trouble because she's <laughs> huggable. <laughs> and the officers will let us know no hugging. If their family has the privilege of coming many miles to see them, they can visit one half hour a week. But they are looking at a TV screen and talking on a phone and the jail praises this wonderful technology. We're also blessed because we can bring bags in and our bags contain things like pencils, 
information sheets, sheets for prayer requests, prayers that we can leave with them, and reading material. Therefore, we get information about them. After we leave, we call families, we talk to legal groups. If they want, we talk to their consulates. We email the jail staff about the medical concerns we've heard. And then also, we are able to be present with them in a way that is so important with them. Any given day in the immigration court, some of us will be there with our buttons that say court watch. It makes the judge sit up a little bit straighter to know that there are people there who care about these people on the TV screen in the jail. And often now that we're, we're getting to know people, they ask us, will you be in court for me? This is my hearing day. And one day recently, Pat and I were there, and the judge asked who we were. And before we could answer, the ICE agent said, oh, they're the court watchers. And recently, a couple of our court watchers had a lawyer come up to them and say, thank you for being here. In those three programs, we have over 100 volunteers, all trained and approved, and of all faiths. This is an interfaith effort. We're developing a new program called Post-Release Accompaniment. And that means just another part of this broken system, if by chance they're released on bond or really released, they're released with nothing. And so they might need to get to the bus station, money for a bus ticket, need clothing, or if they're really released, they've lost everything. And so we have to start all over with them and we have groups that will provide housing, and this is a work in progress, and we're building teams of post-release accompaniment. As I look back now, I wonder why developing all these things I told you about was so hard. I don't have time to tell you the story, and it's a really good one of how we got where we are today. Let me just say that our motto is, we do this peacefully, respectfully, but we never take no for an answer. <laughs> ICE agents and the jail staff all know us because we've been in their face so much <laughs> and because they know that we are not going away. And we've had wonderful support from our allies and actually had to get a bill passed in the Illinois State Legislature to get inside the jail. However, we've had so much support from all of our allies, of all our interfaith community, and we need to continue to work for comprehensive, compassionate immigration reform. But in the meantime, we can never, never forget the people already trapped in this broken immigration system. Those of us across the country that do visitation have to be a little cautious with the advocacy piece. We are blessed because of our jail system that we can do individual advocacy after the visits, and that is a blessing. But we have an umbrella group called the Interfaith Committee for Detained Immigrants, made up of various faith and advocacy groups. 
We are part of the planning for any action that has to take place at the ICE office or the deportation center. But because we've been in their face and they know us, we don't participate. We help in the planning and there are others who can do that. But of course, we all do the letter writing, the phoning, and participate in actions where we haven't been in people's faces. We started to try to do the work that we're doing in January of 2007. And at the time, it was Pat and me. Now there are over 100 volunteers. But all of this did not get in place until March of 2010. It was one step at a time. We started out with an adversarial role with ICE, the sheriff, and the staff at the county jail. They didn't want us. They didn't need us. But again, of course, we never took no for an answer. Now we have really good working relationships with those groups of people. In fact, the last time we met with the sheriff, he said he wants this to be the model program for the United States. And we actually have that in writing, and that's very helpful. The ICE deputy in charge of deportations admitted to us finally that he was the one that was fighting against us getting inside the deportation center. But now he wants everything to continue just as is. And in fact, I keep a protocol that he's written in my pocket every Friday about what we can do at the jail. And how did all of this happen? I think David's point of building relationships, prayer, hard work on the part of many people, and again, the fact that we never take no for an answer. People ask us, why do you want to negotiate with ICE? or with the staff at the jail. That's like the belly of the beast. There's a story I recently heard about an old rabbi who asked his pupils, when does night become day? So one pupil said, oh, that happens when you can look out and tell the difference between a sheep and a dog. And the rabbi said no. And then another student said, oh, it's when you can look at two trees and see a fig tree and a peach tree. The rabbi said, oh, no. Well, then tell us when is it? And the rabbi said, it is when you can look in the face of every man and woman and see your sister and brother. Until you can do this, it is still night. So we negotiate with ICE and the jail staff for two reasons. We look in the face of the immigrants and their families and see our sisters and brothers. And we will do whatever it takes to see that their human and religious rights are being protected. And they tell us things like, you have instilled hope in my life again. Or, I know there are people somewhere that think of us. That is very important to them because they think they're in there and nobody knows they're there. Or your committee support means the world to us. And I personally wouldn't know what to do without your help. 
This is why we negotiate. But the harder part also, if we believe what the rabbi said, we have to look into the faces of the men and women of ICE <coughs> and the jail staff and see our sisters and brothers who also need to be treated with respect. We certainly have feelings about the broken and evil system that we're working in. But this has given us the ability to talk and negotiate. And as Sheriff Nigren said when we met recently, when we opposed you, we didn't have trust. What we do takes trust, and now we have it. <clears throat> we hope that when the officers are looking into our eyes, they also see their sisters and brothers, but that they also see the detainees, and that they will look a little bit more through the eyes of dignity and respect that we use as we look at the detainees. This is why we do what we do, grateful to God and all the wonderful people who have helped to make this possible. Thank you.
on the political, the advocacy level later, but is there any possibility of dialogue with CCA? Any of you have that, or any of these? Um, in Chicago, or near Chicago, unfortunately, we're going to get one of the seven new private prison facilities and we're going to find out because we're developing a campaign now. Um, we've checked and it's probably too late to stop the building, uh, but there are many other issues. For example, ICE has said they're not going to increase beds, so how do you build a 700-bed facility for ICE detainees? What is going to be the plan? But we're working to communicate with ICE and with CCA uh, around that issue. I'd say also in D.C. there's a group called Strength to Love, which is out of the Church of the Savior tradition. Uh, they are purchasing stock in CCA and they're having dialogue. Their approach is much more kind of reform from the inside. Uh, and they're looking at CCA in its broader scope as being a private prison, not just immigration detention. Um, and so, so there may be some things that we can learn from that. I can tell you, at our end, uh, they put up every single wall that they can. We are not allowed to inform. Uh, we get kicked out. Uh, Dr. Mark Hart was kicked out for, uh, for trying to pass out uh, information about El Refugio in the detention center. That could be something as simple as a card about us or giving coloring paper and, and crayons to a child. Uh, so we do not have a working relationship with uh, with with the Corrections Corporation of America. We do meet with ICE officials um, uh, on a on a, about a quarterly basis to just kind of give them feedback on what we're getting. But um, so we're having to use alternative means like the internet. Oh, this is a question for David. Have you found a difference between access for um, volunteers between um, uh, government-run facilities and the private facilities? Yeah, um, I think we found the, the federally run facilities are a whole lot easier um, to, uh, to get access to, are much more careful to follow the detention standards. Um, they also uh, have chaplains that are extremely well trained that have the potential to facilitate some greater access. And I think what JRS, part of what JRS is trying to do now, and I think where they can help us as well, is to have that model be put into other, um, be copied and, and privatized in, in county jails. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's definitely major, major differences in terms of visitor access from depending on the location, the type of facility, as well as the officers um, inside, for sure. Big, big differences there. And, do you have documentation of that? Um, I would, yeah. What I would suggest is just putting you in touch. We have a, we're at www.detentionwatchnetwork.org backslash visitation. You'll see about 15 different groups and their contacts, and I think contacting each of them to, okay. to do that. And I know Human Rights First is starting to do a uh, report around this uh, as well, specifically visitation access. Okay. Um, yes, uh, uh, yesterday Professor Nunn uh, talked about um, where morality comes in, he said that people will say, I'm a Christian, but I'm anti-immigrant, or I'm pro-death penalty. And in the southern states that highly identify with being Christian, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, some of the harshest anti-immigrant legislation has emerged. So I wanted, and David, you've, you've, you've said that you, you have dealt with, um, you've had deep faith reflections with people. So to, could you tell us about your experience, you know, when you are dealing, uh, when you're talking to somebody who identifies strongly with being a Christian, yet comes out with this, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment or even legislation. We had a, a, an experience in the Louisiana legislature this past year where, where uh, uh, one of the pro-anti-immigrant uh, legislators quoted, you know, render under Caesar. That uh, was his justification for his, you know, immigration law, anti-immigration law, which is like, what other, you know. But how do you do this without getting into a, a holy war? You know, I mean, how, how do you keep it? I'm sure everybody has some thoughts on that. I, I guess I found that, um, one is it's a nasty wedding of American exceptionalism with their Christian identity. So a lot of the verses that they choose to privilege and the lens through which they see it is entirely based on their own ideas of American exceptionalism. And, and that's also wedded to, especially for the older generation, ancestors that fought in wars, 
that fought for that exceptionalism, and it's very, very deep, deeply rooted. So, but the five places that I named and hitting them on, um, really, I found begins to open up the door, and I found in this, this, excuse my language, it sucks that I can't come in and preach immigrant rights. And I did that on my very first sermon on a seminary at my middle of the road New Jersey church that was understood itself to be Mayberry and wasn't anymore, and they were angry about it openly. So I have a bunch of, if you've ever seen Gran Torino, I have a bunch of, of um, what's his name, Clint Clint Eastwood's character in my congregation, they fought in war. And I went on my first sermon, I was like, immigrant rights and university, and there's this detention center, la, 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 la. And three people walk out in the middle of my sermon, and there's that kind of closed door that you knew they weren't coming back on. And it was awful. And, um, and, and what I learned is um, it, my integrity still felt intact. And that felt good, because I was speaking for the prophetic tradition. If they weren't there, then screw them. And that's right. But it's also, again, I had to find the Jesus as counselor piece that began to do their funerals, that it was there for them when they were in the hospital, and walk them through those steps. And all of a sudden, two years later, I got the Gran Torino guys on their one day off of work, driving to the detention facility to help me do it. Now, they didn't go inside, but they sat in the parking lot for 45 minutes. <laughs> detention here is, 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 the fact is, that, that, that transformation will happen, but because they're so wedded to that identity, it simply takes time to relearn a new story in their head. The tension there is we have some urgency, unnes urgent, unnecessary suffering happening now, where families are suffering, people are dying inside, and that for me is the huge tension around what direction we go. It's an issue of timing, and it's a hell of a tension, but I'd love to hear what you guys want to say. Do, do any of you see that in, in maybe these rural settings where there are these huge detention facilities, um, some pre prevalence of Islamophobia and that um, you, you have a fear of people, not necessarily based on, on racial grounds, but on religious grounds that, oh, well, they're all terrorists, so we'll let them stay there where we're keeping the rest of us safe from, from them. Uh, and that, that leads to longer and longer detention sojourns. And this is a story I just heard. It's about a visitor. And it fits in with that. There was a religious sister who was going in as a visitor. She lost her hair from cancer. And she wore a scarf around her head. Mm -hmm. And they would not permit her to go into the detention center. And this particular visitation program is concerned because they have some Muslim women who are starting to do the training. They said if sister wore a hat, it would be okay, but not a scarf. <laughs> now, of course, they said it was because they could choke you with a scarf. Well, I mean, we've learned unbelievable things of what people can do with little this is a metal or I mean but that was the rationale but I think the the visitation program underneath is concerned that it's a, a concern about the Muslim women having scarves on their heads as I'm listening to all of all of what you're saying and I'm, I'm reminded of the earlier uh, a speaker mentioning about hope and possibility and I've been really Turning with this, but one of the things that that um, I'm thought that I'm thinking about is Dr. Uh, Rollo May, who wrote the book Courage to Create. There's a line in the book where he says, "When I get in touch with another person's pain that I have caused, I can no longer continue the behavior that caused it." And the secret parts of that are when I get in touch with the other person's pain, because some people enjoy putting people in pain, but it's mm -hmm. only because they're not feeling it. And what I'm hearing from what you're saying, these opportunities to begin to experience other people, the relationship things that you're talking about, create a, a, a space that, that, that opens up. I didn't mean to do that. I, I don't want to be implicated in this. This is not who I am. And the cognitive dissonance in terms of these belief systems that one has had creates that space. And once the space is created, I'm hearing you creating opportunities for people to step into that space and make a change in their life. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of that 50% that someone mentioned that's changeable. 
and, and, and that the church is an untapped resource. And so it just seems to me I'm getting more hope than hopelessness about the possibility of, of expanding uh, uh, and changing the mindset that keeps producing the evil that we keep replicating. One of the most remarkable things I saw was with Sister Joanne um, at a small little Lutheran congregation and there was about 15 people, visitors, as well as a few um, family members of people who were suffering inside, who were there just sharing stories. Not preaching too strong, but, um, but just sharing stories. And the sheriff and the assistant, well, what was it, the sheriff and the assistant warden that were there? The, the chief of the jail and the deputy chief. Yeah, and so I, you were, you, they listened for about an hour and then they... <clears throat> got up um, to speak, and this is what I saw, and Pat and Joanne, please tell me if you saw something different, but I watched the, was it the sheriff, stand up, and he goes, uh, uh, I'm trying to be an actor again. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the point was, he tried to talk, and his something got caught in his throat, and he began to melt. And part of the reason was because Sister Joanne got up and called him by his name instead of this is Sheriff so and so, and we demonized. She said, We don't call him Sheriff, we call him Mike, or whatever his name was. And all of a sudden, he was seen as a human being. He heard what was happening, he was open because of the relationship, and he couldn't speak. He was crying. He got caught up, and all of a sudden, he had to have the other guy come in and speak for him. And he was incredibly embarrassed. But there was a beginning of a purging that happened there that was, it was, it was so profound. It was like, whoa. Okay, so that's the end of the question. In some of the Border Patrol websites and that, you know, they talk about a 55-day training and that this is Homeland Security, this is post 9-11. Uh, how does that get teased out? And the other is, uh, whenever I'm in, I'm L.A. County, uh, Los Angeles, and Central Juvenile Hall, looking at the prison population of Juvenile Hall, you'd think that Los Angeles County was 98% Latino, 1-2% uh, African American, and maybe 0.0% Anglo and Asian. Mm -hmm. um, are local detention facilities being used as criminal <laughs> when we go from administrative law to criminal law. It, it, it seems to me you have detention centers and administrative centers, and then you have criminal centers, and the population appears to be about the same in the racial makeup. So I guess, I guess it's a broad question, and it, it's just... just how you, I, I, I get, well, the question is I'm trying to formulate it is, how do you distinguish between what's criminal and what's administrative? I mean, administrative law is not a criminal offense. It's a separate court system, right? I mean, I'm not a lawyer. But. And I don't know, yeah, I'd say we don't do it very well. Um, I mean, even inside the Stewart Detention Center, I've heard the detainees referred to as, as prisoners by staff. Um, and I've heard the warden interchangeably use that, and then he'll all of a sudden forgive himself and say, well, I, I came out of a correctional background, <laughs> as though there's something really different in how this is how this is run. So, and then I think also tying it with uh, post 9-11, in Alabama right now, there's been a lot of talk because the, the way the law was written, that individuals may be denied uh, access to water uh, as a part of the, of the law there. And that was happening in my community, uh, you know, right after 9-11, when I uh, found out that there was a mother, single mother, who had utility services and fell behind, and uh, we helped her scrape up all the money and had gone 10 days without utilities, including water, and then was told, well, thank you for paying your, 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 your late fees and, and what you owed, uh, but unless you can provide a valid social security number, you won't have your utilities uh, returned. And in speaking with the city manager, the city managers said uh, that in this era of terrorism, we need to know who's in our community. To which my kind of, uh, the, the, one of the things I learned about, so one of my flippant responses back to him was, if you're trying to say that this single mother is a terrorist, let me say the only thing terroristic is this policy, um, which would deny a child water. Um, 
So, I, I mean, I think it is important to remind ourselves that, that this issue is connected to 9-11, and I know Andrew Black's going to be talking later, and, but that this is also connected to a whole system of social control that dates back to Jim Crow and to the mass incarceration of people of color, and we need to find ways to, to create unique alliances uh, that will remind ourselves and remind others of that. Uh, I, I go back to Stewart County. It is in the, it is it is uh, predominantly African American and predominantly you know poor. Uh, we need to find ways to say that the very same people who are still living below the poverty level are disqualified to work in the Stewart Detention Center because of the system of control and mandatory minimums and probation and felony convictions. They are they are they are they are disqualified to work there and yet they don't see the connection. We don't see the connection. We're not making those connections that say that these prisons are not about uh, creating uh, places of, uh, uh, not, uh, not job creation uh, sources for, for impoverished communities. We've got to find creative ways uh, to work around that. To me, I feel like that's the next frontier, is how do you build these subversive alliances with the communities that are, that are marginalized, that where these locate where these centers are located, um, these lo these centers are not located uh, in in places of privilege.